This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Cuccio, and today we're doing a very, very unusual episode. For one, I'm here by myself. Uh, Brian's away on vacation uh, in the south of the U.S. for a couple of weeks, and so I hope he's having a good time there. And Mayher uh, is at Consensus, where I'm sure he's at the moment you know, having fun and seeing some great talks and panels and things like that. I unfortunately couldn't make it. Um, and we're recording this the day before this releases. So, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of unusual, but hopefully we'll, we'll have a great conversation with our guests today. Also, uh, something that wasn't planned, we have an extra guest. So originally we had planned to do this with uh, Trent McConaughey, who our past listeners will know as the CEO, CTO and founder uh, of Scribe and Big Chain DB and, and now uh, IPDB, or at least, you know, uh, part of the, the founding team there, and uh, he, he he came on the the the, the call uh, in uh, his hotel room with Fred Ursham, who's a former uh, member at uh, at Coinbase and former co founder at Coinbase, and uh, yeah, so we got Trent and Fred, and so Fred is going to be with us for the first half of the show because he's actually got to go meet Meher um, in New York. And so Fred's going to be talking to us about AI and DAO and sort of the intersection of AI and, and blockchain technologies. And then for the second half of the show, we'll be talking to Trent um, about IPDB and what's new with Big Chain DB and this sort of thing. So, hey, guys. Glad to Hello. have you both Hi. on. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your patience with us. <laughs> no, no that's, it's, uh, it's no problem at all. And, um, you know, I, I like structure. And when, when, <laughs> things, when things are kind of out of whack... I get uncomfortable, but um, I think I think I've gotten over the hump of you know this is going to go well. Well, yeah, we'll make um, the structure yeah. unstructured. Great. Uh, so since Fred has to leave in, in a few minutes to go meet with my hair, um, uh, one one topic that uh, uh, Trent thought it would be great to have him on would be to talk about the intersection of blockchains and DAO, and this is a topic that I haven't really you know thought of much i mean i've, I've of course uh, heard of people talking about it and it's come up recently but it, it's not something that honestly i have not really uh, delved into very much so um we'll spend you know 20 30 minutes talking about that I, uh, I, i'm interested in, in, in hearing how blockchains can intersect with uh with uh with ai um so guys uh well specifically fred tell us how how do ai and blockchains come together what what What's what's the main thesis here when when you want when you're talking about AI and a DAO? Yeah, sure. I think Trent has done most of the thinking in this field, and I have probably stolen a lot of his thoughts, and then maybe added one or one or two side layers while he's probably built further up the stack than I have. Um, the way I would describe it is, um, at the moment, there are a couple tech giants in the world, the most valuable companies in the world, the Googles, the Facebooks, etc who have made very valuable companies out of big proprietary data silos. Um, and due to network effects, those data silos have gotten bigger and stronger. And the companies are really valuable because they effectively can extract rent on these data silos because only they have control of them, own them, can access them. Um, and so goes the cycle. Um, and I started thinking about, you know, what implications does that have on artificial intelligence? And uh, as Trent would very quickly point out, this is potentially a dangerous trend because if, it, if it's true that AIs really feed on data and they really get better because they have a lot of training data, they have a great breadth of training data, and all of the data is owned by a couple for-profit uh, private companies, then when really intelligent AIs come out, that who, whose interests might those AIs serve? Um, probably that of the centralized company, if that's where all the data is coming from. Um, so that, that alarmed me. Um, and I started then thinking about, well, what alternatives do we have? And I realized in some sense that blockchains effectively represent a big open data set 
And um, now that we have, you know, sort of blockchain tokens, and we've always had since Bitcoin, I don't mean to make that sound new, but with blockchain based tokens, it's this kind of magical system whereby everyone is incented to contribute to effectively one big database via the blockchain. And that seemed to be a potential kind of savior um, in, in this context. So I guess that's, that's how I think about it. And that's how I started to get convinced that um, the blockchain in effect can represent the biggest open data set um, in the world for AIs to train on. And that actually might be a great thing for all of humanity as, as a result. Yeah, is, is, say, is that accurate in your, yeah, in I think, your perspective? Yeah, largely. And um, I, I, my hope is that it's a great thing. It also is, you know, potentially dangerous on its own. Um, but we have to hope and we have to, you know, infuse our ethics and our opinions and do what we can to try to tilt this thing towards something that's good for humanity, right? Um, and uh, overall, uh, the thesis is strong, you know, to summarize, I think it's, it's valuable for the listeners. Um, uh, modern AI, a lot of the stuff, the deep networks, all this, uh, really live and thrive on data. Um, you know, you don't have to change the algorithm much. You can just have 10x, 100x more data and your error rates can go down from 20% to 5% to 1% and so on. So it's really about the data. You know, the data is the moat. This is actually, you know, the, how Google built its house in the last 10 years and Amazon and others. Um, so, and, you know, there is this data moat uh, and a data network effect as well, actually, because if you have better data, more data, then you can get better models, you can attract more users, and you have this flywheel effect that goes on. So it, it's, it's been very powerful for these um, incumbent companies that have more and more data. And I've been asking myself the question, too, similar to Fred, of, you know, what can we do about this, right, to sort of um, break the cycle um, and um, open it up to humanity more broadly? Right, such that um, startups who want to compete on AI for these uh, data incentive intensive type AI systems uh, have a chance. And so um, an open database um, or at least an open exchange of data um, can really help um, where you, people are incentivized to submit data sets. Um, and you can actually have them in two flavors, right? One of them is where it's just sort of sharing data. Um, but I think actually to make it really incentivized well, you really need to have it where People are getting paid for the data sets that they submit. Um, you know, it's it's truly an exchange, right? Um, or at least a marketplace where you can buy and sell data, and in a very fluid fashion. And um, to this note, we've actually we've been spending a lot of time with BigChainDB and IPDB, um, helping to set up ecosystems for data exchanges. And one that we actually just announced today, which I'm pretty excited about, is um, in the world of self-driving cars, which many people call the the killer app of of AI. Um, uh, data is a big problem. You know, you can't have just 1% error rate because that would mean, you know, one crash every 100 miles or something, right? Um, you have to have, uh, you know, one in a billion, one in 100 billion failure rates. And um, to do that, actually, it means you need orders of magnitude more data. So maybe you only need, you know, say, 1,000 or 10,000 miles of training data to be 1% error. But to be, you know, one in a billion error, one in 10 billion error, uh, you need um, hundreds of millions of miles potentially, right? something that no single automaker can get on its own. So what if you have a system where they can be incentivized to submit their data and then um, they can train these algorithms together um, collectively. So this is actually kind of a win-win-win, right? Because the automakers each can make their cars with, with um, more accurate models that you know saves lives at the same time um, getting benefit for all their hard effort for um, gathering this data. And of course, it will be not just the automakers putting in the data then you'll have you know, lots of people driving and trying to figure out a more efficient ways of putting this data in. So that's an example of where it can really help, but it goes beyond too, right? Um, and yeah, so data exchanges um, for AI training data, um, I view they, they will be a fundamental um, piece of internet infrastructure um, and it will extend beyond just self-driving cars and hopefully help to equalize the opportunities for people um, deploying algorithms, AI algorithms. Okay, uh, I got a lot of questions here. I mean. So first, let's uh, let's let's sort of restate the problem. The, the 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 fundamental problem is is sort of an extension of the existing problem with regards to data centralization. So you know, you, we have Facebook, for instance, or Google, and they hold an enormous amount of data. Uh, as users, we sort of give them our data. In, you know. In, in exchange for free services or ad supported services. And those companies get an enormous amount of value out of that data because of everything that they can learn from it. And the, the, the core problem here is that once we have, or as, as AI continues to evolve, uh, that data will also serve AIs. 
and in effect make those companies more and more powerful because since they're the only ones that have the data, which is essentially the you know what you feed into an AI, uh, they're the only ones that can effectively create you know r really comparable uh, and and high um, quality AIs. That that's sort of the the fundamental problem here is is yeah. this data centralization further it, you know s enhances or supports the development of strong AI by strong incumbents. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. I would actually bifurcate it into kind of two parts. One is the one exactly what you're describing, where you have um, an incentives issue whereby if Apple is creating Siri, Siri is probably going to serve the interests of Apple and not the interests of the person with the phone. And that's scary for, for us as humans. So that, that's the issue you're kind of describing. The other issue is a rate of innovation issue. Right. So if there are only four big companies who have these big data sets then the number of people in the world who can create really great AIs all of a sudden is very, very small because very few people have access to the data through which to train AIs and um, make really great AIs. Now, if that data was exposed to everyone in the world, now everyone in the world has the ability to create great AIs and the rate of AI um, technological development goes up drastically. You might imagine by one to two, at least orders of magnitude. Um, so it's, it's both kind of an ethics and safety issue and a rate of innovation issue. So on the ethics part, I, I, I think that blockchain technologies is sort of talked about a lot as the platform or the platforms that will allow for data to be liberated or for, um, users to regain uh, their, their data, essentially, where we're talking about um, allowing for users to give access to their data to you know, large uh, internet companies through access controls, through encryption, this sort of thing. But essentially, the data ownership, uh, users regain data, uh, ownership of their data, and they, they delegate the use of the data to large companies. Now, this, this shift in itself, you know, probably if, if it were to happen would take a, a very long time because we'd have to find new incentive models for those large companies to provide services where they don't really have access to the, you know, free and encumbered access to the data as they have now. And that seems like a, a necessary first step uh, if we are to have these um, open data sets uh, where users can then essentially rent out or provide sort of, sort of paid access to their data for other AI systems to learn from. How do you see this, this sort of progression towards what you're talking about? So I see it as just where, where are the problems, you know, the ones that you can address first, right? So you could try to do it for, you know, just personal data in Facebook. But um, to your point, Sebastian, that's actually, you know, is there going to be enough value to consumers? And probably not, right? Um, but if it's for something like self-driving cars, where it's clearly a win-win-win across the board, then there's a clear incentive. And there's other ones where there's clear incentive too, you know, like medical data records, right? Where um, people are merging their, their data across um, different silos, right? Like I, I live in Germany and I go from hospital A to hospital B. Hospital B doesn't have the data that hospital A has on me. Um, so I would have to actually go around and collect it right now and collect it to, and share it with them, but it's really hard. So it's much cleaner if you can actually have this data out there in the cloud, encrypted, et cetera. And then I can just provide access to the hospitals as needed, right? And then also at the same time, I can provide per, um, permission to scientists to conduct research on this data. So that's sort of a societal benefit. So there's benefit just to myself personally for me and an incentive for me to, to share my data that way, but also um, to society. And so kind of go across the board and you can ask, you know, where are there benefits for um, data pooling to happen? Um, and, you know, I gave a talk earlier today and I gave other examples too with like diamond fraud and with uh, 3D printing fraud and sort of a lot of other problems in fraud in general, right? So, uh, but it has to be problem-based. It can't be just saying, okay, well, you know, I don't like that Facebook has my, my data. Um, well, you might not like it, but, um, you know, a lot of mainstream won't care enough to change. So I do hope that we find a way that um, there is some way to repopulate a, a social network that is more... Uh, open and equal and so on. And I bet someone will crack that problem in the next two or five years. Um, but um, I don't think there are clear answers today on that. 
Yeah, and I mean, it's not just social networks. I mean, just think of the enormous amount of data that Google has, yeah. uh, and, and not only the the data itself, but then there's the metadata and you know the uh, the the um, the regressions that you can you can make from that data, from which you can learn a whole lot of other things. What what types of incentives would you see? I mean, I can see the incentive. I can see how on the on the health side, there's a there's a real real win win there. On the smart driving car side. Uh, how that may be possible because self-driving cars um, don't really exist yet, so there, there, there are no like sort of standards and normal operating procedures in that space. So you know, that that may merge as as sort of the standard ways to have open shared data because we can recognize that it's benefits for all. So on on the sort of more traditional incumbent uh, large internet companies, as we call them in Europe, GAFAs. On that side, how where how how would you see that shift happening? If 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 it were to happen, what would it take for um, a company like Google to want to open up uh, their user data on an open marketplace where users, in fact, have control and access to their data directly and and cede that control and access to to Google to have access to their services? I think the answer is that it's a classic innovator's dilemma problem, and that actually may not or ever happen. Yeah. Um, just because they have so much revenue that that is really just dependent on extracting rent from this centralized data silo. So I think the much more likely scenario is new projects that organically emerge, which uses this which use this model first in the same way that kind of Bitcoin emerged with a token model and is you know is taking over starting to take over money. Um, it wasn't, you know, a, a bank, for example, that was willing to cannibalize their own revenue with this radical new model. What do you, yeah. what do you think? Uh, I think that that's a possibility. I, I just thinking out loud, though, actually, there's a couple of uh, ideas that have that popped into my head related that have been emerging the last few weeks. Um, well, one actually has been emerging the last few months, and this is GDPR in Europe, right? The General Data Protection Rights, and this is sort of like a Y2K um, for 2018. In May of 2018, anytime that you um, Facebook wants your data, they have to ask your permission, right? But and it's but it's it could play out in one of two ways. It could be where you just have to click another OK button, just sort of like a cookies thing, where it doesn't really matter. Or it could play out in a, a different and it way. Just where, breaks UI for every yeah, website. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. And that would be the sad way, and that's a possible scenario. But there are a lot of startups and a lot of money flowing into systems where it's actually about um, tokenizing consent, for example. And um, this actually could um, really reduce the friction for um, other players to come in there because if you're sort of tokenizing consent then that's actually moving a lot of your data and giving a lot more power to you so that's pretty exciting that's a possibility there's another one that i've been thinking about and this is actually more general on the tokens thing actually largely thanks to fred's excellent writing in his blog so i encourage any reader to look at his stuff too so uh and i think of it as we've, we've been thinking about token design systems where it's sort of a, a new project from the ground up and so on but you can also tokenize the enterprise um and let me explain and, well, you can tokenize the enterprise, and the, the result is that the enterprise might be able to melt into the community. And I'll, I'll give a couple examples. There's really two types of enterprises to think about here. There's ones like the 3Ms of the world or the Amazons, where they're already internally um, five or 50 different business units that have their own uh, profit and loss statements, et cetera. Each one of them could actually create their own token ecosystem internally, but also um, open up to sell those tokens externally. And so you've got they're, they're used to having APIs to the world, right? So that could be very, very interesting. Imagine just even Bezos does, you know, tokenize this one business unit and sees what happens, right? And what would be his incentive? Um, the incentive would be that if you're including um, more people to be able to buy into the tokens and there's greater demand, then the actual overall value to the, uh, to the enterprise goes up, right? So it's sort of like a second IPO, like why can't an IPO company ICO on top of that, right? So it could be an interesting idea. And then you don't have to have it just for, you know, five or 50 different business units. It could also simply be one big more a large company like Facebook, you know, ignore the Instagram part of Facebook, et cetera, just Facebook itself is one larger monolith. What if that was tokenized where the users then could start to um, um, not only buy tokens, but they can get tokens of benefit every time they use Facebook, right? So then actually Facebook overall, the value to Facebook, the corporation could be higher. And that might happen, right? This is just a re uh, an idea I've been thinking about. I don't know if you have thoughts, Fred, tokenizing from within, right? Melting the enterprise into the community. I think it's a very smart idea. I think the likelihood that a two hundred eighty billion dollar company actually does it in the public market is low. I agree, but it I would agree. be awesome. It would be, and but here's the thing, right? Like you know, two years ago, four years ago, 
we thought that these ICOs were anomalies, right? And it was sort of like, you oh, know, yeah. one every two months or six months, just like you and I were talking about. Sure. So, you know, what is weird today? It could be normal tomorrow, right? And maybe it'll start with, you know, just some visionary company, right? And we're seeing like with the Overstock guys, right? Um, they're, they're doing some radical things and others are following, right? So, so um, something is impossible until it isn't, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, totally. And so you mentioned a while ago uh, uh, data exchanges or data marketplaces. What would these look like and uh, what technologies could they be built on? So when I think of an exchange, and I'm sure Fred will have ideas too, but I think of it as a marketplace where the price is set automatically, right? You have people coming in saying, I'm going to pay X dollars for this. And other people are saying, I'm willing to pay Y dollars for this, right? So you've got a, a set of bids and a set of asks. And when they match up, you know, when someone is willing to pay more than someone else is asking for, then they line up and that gets sold, right? And um, so you just basically, the core of it is maintaining the, these lists of bids and asks, um, which can be fairly simple, right? At the very, very core of it. And then in terms of technology stacks, what we built recently, we're, uh, we were actually surprised by the simplicity of the architecture. Uh, it was simply IPDB, which is the public version of BigchainDB. Uh, which has governance, et cetera. We'll talk more about that later. And a single page web app on top, right? So people can uh, log in, create an account with a brain wallet type setup, HD wallet, that sort of thing. And um, and then basically start dumping in data, et cetera. And that was all we needed. Um, it, you know, it could support tokens directly. It could support the querying, et cetera, directly. And we were kind of amazed, right? Because it's people talk about serverless architectures, but of course you're still using, you know, the Amazon cloud or something. Now it's serverless where it's a decentralized cloud at the back end, right? Now that's a very simplistic thing. That's sort of a proof of concept when you actually want to go to something that is, you know, more full fledged, um, then I, I defer to Fred because he has more experience in this. No, that, uh, that, that sounds pretty spot on to me. I, I guess I was thinking that I think some of the places we might see this first are marketplaces where monetizing the data is easy um, and paying uh, people who contribute the data is easy. So one example of this uh, that Trent actually brought up uh, earlier in a presentation today was a company called Numeri, which is started by a friend of mine, uh, this guy, Richard Crabe. And um, it's funny how small this world is yeah. sometimes. And <laughs> Reba's my friend. Their first investor is a friend of mine. So there, there you go. go. <laughs> um, and to, to me, that's a great um, first example of how this might play out in the sense that uh, going back to the beginning of the talk, effectively what they're doing is they are in a centralized manner paying a bunch of um, uh, data outlets like Reuters and Bloomberg, et cetera, for their data. And then they are distributing it to anyone who wants it um, in an encrypted, homomorphically encrypted manner uh, so that anyone can have access to this data and build kind of the best AI they can. So it doesn't take too much imagination to take their current model and then extrapolate it such that maybe it isn't Numerize a central entity who's collecting all the data and distributing it. Rather, anyone in the world who has valuable data to make stock predictions could get paid for contributing it. Um, and this is already happening, actually. Like There are these kind of small random companies around the world who will pay people in different countries to go and count how many Cokes are on the shelf or whatever. So this is happening to a certain extent already, but I think um, if you properly incent this system using a blockchain-based token, you start incentivizing anyone in the world to contribute data, which could be valuable in this case for, for financial predictions. Yeah. And the resulting behavior is quite clear. It's a bunch of AIs that feed more or less on this crowdsourced data, and the result is better financial predictions and the output of that, which is just more money, easily feeds the people who contributed the data and, and so on and so forth. And something that Fred, uh, actually, something that Fred is pointing to, too, there's actually this emerging sort of discipline of um, designing token-based systems, right? Um, even, you know, right after my talk, uh, Juan Bonet gave a talk and he actually pointed, you basically have to ask yourself, you know, what are the ways that people can earn tokens? What are the ways that people can uh, spend tokens? And then how do those get exchanged, right? And those are kind of the questions to ask. And you have to ask, you know, this question about each actor in the ecosystem and then design the thing overall such that you've got the, the sort of different feedback loops that you like, right? And this isn't much different than classic multi-sided platforms, right? Like the Googles and Facebooks of the world that have multiple customers, et cetera. But now it's actually got um, more tokens of value flowing around so you can actually have these network effects um, more directly, right? So related to this, you know, data that's in there, you know, you can think about, well, how do you set up designing um, a system for people contributing their music, right? A music rights system for like compensating artists, et cetera. 
or data or you know social data, all of this, right? So it generalizes quite well um, beyond sort of data for just AI. Right. Okay. I, I see then how the the token model that we've seen for you know in, in a lot of projects in the blockchain space might might apply to data. So the way that I'm seeing this play out. So you know, for instance, a few years from now, for for example, we have sort of a public open database that is the sort of standard where all self-driving cars submit their data. So you, you buy a self-driving car, there's some sort of an alliance or a consortium of car companies uh, that build this open database for the benefit of all. And they send the data or they, they allow for users to sort of sign for the, their data to be sent to this open public database. Uh, the data is uh, anonymized or uh, with some sort of you know, encryption mechanism um, made to be stored in the database in the open database as encrypted data. And then on the other side of that, you may have a company like Google or another car manufacturer or anybody developing an AI that through this database well, would, would uh, rent the data, uh, effectively paying the users who fed the data into the into the central system or into the, the distributed database system. Uh, that way we have this massive data structure that can serve the purpose of anyone who wants to use it for research or for building new AIs or, or what have you. Uh, is that sort of what we're looking at here? Yeah, it's a pretty good at capturing, yeah. And, um, you know, there's going to be the core stuff of storing, you know, the, the databases that store the metadata metadata, and some of the smaller modes of data, and then the larger um, streams of data and stuff and data blobs. This will be in things like the file systems, you know, like IPFS with Filecoin, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's actually going to be building blocks emerging on top too. Just like people have been talking about reputation systems on people, we will be seeing reputation systems on data. Um, and uh, and a whole wide variety of sort of an ecosystem emerging on top of data itself, right? And we're not seeing this right now because all the data is locked up, right? Mm. So as soon as this stuff gets unlocked with these decentralized data exchanges and marketplaces, we're going to just see a flowering, right? And, you know, as an illustration of that, right, just very recently, there was a front page of The Economist talking about data is the new oil. But if it's the new oil, well, right now we've got Rockefeller time at plus two, plus three. We don't actually have it where it's accessible to all these, you know, innovative entrepreneurial minds. Well, this is very, very fascinating topic. Uh, I, I would love to know what like a GDPR regulator thinks about this. <laughs> well, actually, there it is totally related, right? And um, yeah. the, 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 the challenge actually with GDPR is that the regulations right now don't have much to say about um, if the data is encrypted or not, right? So if I have personal data um, and it's out there in plain text um, and it's, you know, let's say I'm living in Germany and it's this data is sitting in the USA, then that's not good, right? It's got to be right now in German servers. But what if it's actually um, encrypted, right? And then also what about right to be forgotten, right? So if I have my um, personal data and, and I delete it and it was on German server, soils, servers, sorry, fine. But uh, once again, Maybe it's encrypted and I throw away the private key and I literally burn the private key, right? And I can so cryptographically prove the private key was burned. The laws don't have anything to say about this right now, right? So actually, uh, we've been iterating with regulators in Germany on this and others have been too. Um, and it's really important that the law actually catches up to what's possible with the technology. That's Just true. like we're seeing in, in, you know, in, in the ICO side of things where you know the law has to catch up and in the meantime, we have to do the best we can. It's actually similar with things like uh, data protection rights. That's true. I mean, the, the the right to be forgotten thing, that's something that comes up a lot, uh, you know, when, when I'm talking to corporates as well about GDPR is, what about this right to be forgotten? Well, okay, well, I mean, they, they, they sort of, the, 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 the sort of go-to uh, line is, well, you know, blockchains are transparent, how can you possibly have a right to be forgotten? Then, you know, you later on say, okay, we can have encryption, uh, yeah. you can have uh, things like zero knowledge proofs, this sort of thing that uh, would effectively allow for right to be forgotten to exist within a blockchain. Uh, but then the regulation, as you mentioned, is not, uh, the, is not conclusive on what, what is forgotten. If, if I forget or, you know, destroy my, destroy my, my private key, is that, is that data really forgotten? Uh, that, that definitely needs to be, um, made clear in the regulation. Sebastian, I'm thinking, you know, we probably only have Fred a bit here longer. Maybe we should talk about AI DAOs for a little bit. Hey, that uh, sounds good. Yeah. So the arch DAO. Um, so there's a quick uh, backgrounder on this, and that is um, machine creativity 
uh, like AI DAOs that are, are sorry, AIs that are creative for, for sort of narrow domains are possible and they've been around for actually decades, right? So there are um, uh, AIs that can generate art, uh, like visual art images uh, that have been sold, et cetera. Um, there are ones that have gener designed quantum circuits, uh, Leaks Factor and others. Um, I, I, in the talk that I gave earlier today, uh, I showed how my friend Greg Hornby was creating necklaces um, and the, the tokens on necklaces and how they're quite pretty and stuff. Myself too, this, my PhD was on this, right, for um, what was considered creative analog design and I was getting AIs to do it. So the point is that there is um, a whole practice as a subfield of AI or subfields uh, for creative AI uh, or machine creativity. So this is a baseline. Um, now for the art DAO then, uh, there's a recipe and it's best to describe in just the five step recipe. Uh, step one, um, you've got this uh, agent running, um, you know, on decentralized processing substrate, you know, Ethereum or something else. And it generates um, an artifact, say a piece of digital art or a jewelry design. Step two, it, it claims copyright or registers it that it just has it. And this, this step isn't even really necessary, but it, it's cool to think. And by the way, there are regulations towards um, AIs getting rights in Europe. Um, or you can actually just register in Zug, Switzerland, and then it's got rights because it's a corporation. So that's a whole other story. So it claims copyright. And then um, step three is it posts it for sale on a marketplace. Uh, by the way, give it 10 editions for fun, right? Like a scribe style. So post it for sale, these 10 editions on, say, Open Bazaar, decentralized marketplace, or even something centralized like Getty. Um, sell them. So maybe sell each of them for $1. Um, and maybe overall it costed you $1 of compute power. So you, you, you make $10 because you've got 10 editions. So now you've spent $1 of compute power, you've got back $10, right? So now what you do is you make 10 more pieces of art and um, each one of those, you sell 10 editions, you've got a hundred bucks, right? And remember, this is uh, an agent, right? So it's a DAO that's running um, decentralized and it's creating value on its own, right? And it's accumulating wealth. It doesn't have any modes to feed. Um, it just, all it has to do is, you know, make more paper clips, i.e. art, right? And so it can go from having $100 of wealth to 1,000, 10,000 and we'll have the world's first AI millionaire, right? And then maybe it'll keep going. Maybe it'll be a billionaire, right? So that's pretty exciting. And I, I like to use it because I think it's a very um, tangible example of something that you can build with today's technology. You know, just a bunch of components off the shelf. And there's uh, a few projects now that people have reached out to me that are starting to build on this. So I'm, I'm excited. Hopefully one of them will be able to announce in the next three or six months, but any listeners out there, go ahead and build this thing. It's actually cool, right? There's going to be, a, I hope, a whole bunch of different art DAOs out there that get built. And it's also really useful as an, a launch pad to explore what this means because you can generalize in like five or 10 different directions. And each one is interesting on its own, right? For example, what if this thing starts generating computer code that isn't just art, you know, arbitrary computation? What if it's mines GitHub and people put code in GitHub that is really dangerous doing like hits on humans and stuff, right? And by the way, it's... It, you might think, well, code doesn't know how to combine other code. Well, actually it does. There's this subfield of AI called genetic programming, where I spent 10 years of my life, which is actually all about searching through the space of computer programs to come up with the next program. And you know, even if most random pro um, programs it tries completely suck and fail, it doesn't matter if that last 1% or 0.1% has something interesting, that's all it needs. Um, so basically this is the whole idea of you know, the art DAO, uh, that AI that can accumulate wealth. You might think, oh, well, that's just an oddity, but um, something where there's a real incentive by companies is to be capital light. So, you know, in the world of semiconductors, all the companies, uh, the factories got too expensive, so they all went fabulous, right? So Qualcomm, NVIDIA, all these guys, they don't own any factories anymore, right? And other times, you know, BMW, they went and sold all their factories too, right? And they're just focusing on design and then uh, outsourcing the manufacturing. Or Uber, right? When they have the self-driving cars, are they going to go and spend billions of dollars or actually hundreds of billions probably to, to buy their own auto fleet? Wouldn't it be easier if they just made each self-driving car also self-owning, right? And that way they can stay capital light. So there's an incentive for corporations to be capital light. It's a better return on their assets. And um, of course, then are we going to be handing over, you know, the vast majority of humanity's assets to these bots? So there's a whole bunch of questions raised. Raised. I think it's really fun uh, and dangerous, and this is why we need to talk about it now. So yeah, you know this 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 example you gave. I, I've never never thought that an AI could create art, uh, a, a, you know, possibly create value out of that art. It, it reminds me of this uh, this um, Mike Hearn talk from many years ago that he did somewhere. I think it was at Google where he talks about so the you know the the self driving car that is an, its own agent and goes around and does. It builds rides to people and then gets in the highway and then, you, yeah. know, you know, like 
takes the fast lane and pays the highway in Bitcoin. And then, you know, after a certain, after it has enough money in the bank, like it goes and orders another car, right? Like this, it's, yeah. it's, it sort of reminds me of this exam, this example that he gave in this talk. And I've never thought when we think of AI and sort of the threats of AI, it's, it's often this sort of, you know, the AI will take us over and will sort of destroy humankind because it deems it to be a sort of a parasite or a cancerous uh, life form on the planet, or you, know, you might tell AI to cure cancer and it'll sort of kill humans because, you know, as a side effect of killing cancer. But I've never thought of AI as asserting financial dominance on humankind. And if you have an AI that starts making money through some sort of value creation, and then I, that AI starts getting smarter and starts creating other businesses, you might have like you know the biggest corporation in the world yeah. would be an AI. And then asserting financial dominance on everyone else and just kill us by just like economically, right? Just we'll, we'll all starve it. because we have no more money to buy food or you know, any resources and the AI will have all the, all the world's resources. Exactly. And by the way, on the micro earn thing, actually, so the Terra Zero guys, it's a couple of university students in Berlin. They're doing the self-owning forest, which is also super cool. And um, they're, they're writing about it. And among their references, they were digging and they actually came across uh, also um, a Reddit post uh, by Mike Hearn from like 2011 or something as well. So full kudos to Mike for actually like seeing this way before almost anyone. And I'm sure if you dig, I, th I don't know if they found anything specifically that Nick, Nick Zabo had or Ian Grigg, but I'm sure there's some stuff that those guys had too, right? Because they always do, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, to me, I just happen to have thought of this sort of from my own angle and stuff. Um, but overall, there's been a lot of thinking before me and there's going to be a lot more after too. And, you know, I think it's a conversation that we we all want to be having um, because uh, we don't want to put ourselves into the situation where we are subservient to these, you know, new landowners, right? I, I, I'm sure this is sort of uh, talked about is that the AI will perhaps wipe out a lot of, you know, knowledge work in the next, uh, you know, 20, 50, you know, 100 years. Yeah. But, you know, creative work has always sort of been thought of as untouched, right? Like creative work will continue to be a human endeavor and all the starving artists are gonna, just going <laughs> to yeah. be, be even more starving because the AIs will have taken over their, their creativity work. So... It's sad and for them a, I too. think there's a key insight in what Trent said too, which is that um, if you look back at the history of corporations, and part of this is stolen from uh, Simone de la Rouvière in a, in a recent blog post, effectively what corporations did is they allowed us to, in some way, pool resources to have a greater scale of uh, humans and self-organization, and corporations got really big and accomplished things that humans had never done before as a result of this. And then the interesting side effect um, of this was that humans eventually became equivalent to a person in the eyes of the law, uh, or sorry, corporations became equivalent to a, to a person in the eyes of the law. And now I think this is kind of the next logical step where, you know, there is no difference uh, in the eyes of the blockchain between an AI or, or any object and a human. So, they're the same. They can control resources in the same way. Uh, it turns out that an AI may actually be much more effective at feeding on huge amounts of data than any human could be yeah. and thus can achieve much broader scale. Yeah. Um, and because the blockchain is asset based and it, it can fund itself in doing so. So you just um, it, it, it kind of follows that this is the next natural step in self-organization and, and how we and how we view the world. Yeah. On the blockchain, no one knows you're an AI. Okay, well, this is all really fascinating. We should definitely do a another show, a, sort of a full show, just on this topic, where I have we'll, where, where we'll have done more research and, and we'll have more insights, and, and hopefully we'll have a uh, on my side a much more interesting, <laughs> intelligent conversation. But uh, but uh, yeah, Fred, th thanks so much for for coming on uh, at sh such a short notice, uh, and uh, yeah, I think you got to go meet Meher now. I do. Yeah. So. Trent, thanks for inviting me uh, impromptu, and it, it was a pleasure. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll have you on at some point again and say hi to me here. Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is your wallet, your complete user interface to cover all your blockchain needs. I've been using it and I've been loving it. Now, Jax supports a lot of different cryptocurrencies. It supports Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, Ethereum Classic, Zcash, Augur Rep, and they're adding many more. Keep responding to users' needs. Now, with Jax, the nice thing is that you can manage all of those coins 
within a single wallet and you are in control of your own private keys, they're not on their server. And there's a single 12 word seed that you can use to back up your wallet, all your coins and sync them across different devices. Talking about devices, they're on pretty much any device that you can think of. You can get it on PC, Mac, Linux, you can get it on smartphones like Android and Apple and iPhone, you can get it on tablets or even, there are even browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. And on top of that, in JAX, you can actually exchange different cryptocurrencies for each other because they've integrated a shapeshift. And more partnerships and integrations are coming down the line in 2017 that are going to make JAX even better. So JAX is really making blockchain and cryptocurrencies accessible for the masses, easy to use for the masses. Make sure to, sure to get your own JAX wallet at JAX.io or you can get it from any of the app stores you are using. We'd like to thank JAX for their support of Epicenter. All right, so yeah, Trent. So com coming back to the what we had intended to, to talk about for the for this episode, which was IPDB and Big Chain DB, we first had you on in 2015, uh, and we talked about Scribe then. Of course, uh, that was sort of your main project at the time. And then you came back a year ago. I checked. I last checked. It was about 50 episodes ago uh, in in April um, to talk about uh, the work that you've been doing on Big Chain DB and how how that work had come out of a Scribe and what you've learned what you had learned from a scribe. Uh, and at that time, when we had you on, you sort of hinted at the fact that there would be a public big chain DB network. I remember when you told me about that, like I was completely blown away by that idea. I, I talked to people about it extensively, like my team and like people I met. It was like, there's going to be a public, you know, big chain DB network. And I thought that was really a really fascinating idea. So yeah, tell us like how, how have things progressed for you and how have things progressed in, in, in terms of sort of, big chain and how that idea now has turned into you know the IPDB network. Yeah, sure, my pleasure. And once again, thanks for having me uh, again. Um, so uh, going back to Ascribe, right? Um, when we did Ascribe, the goal was always to serve the creators. Uh, we saw that our friends, artists, um, and all throughout the globe, you know, artists were getting a raw deal. Um, not only artists creating digital art, but musicians and otherwise, right? So this was always sort of the, the driving impetus. And as we went along uh, with the scribe, of course, we, we ran into issues of scale. We've been, we had been building on the Bitcoin blockchain. And so we decided um, and we looked around and, you know, talking to different friends, building some of the blockchain systems then. And none of them were really approaching scale um, by leveraging existing big data technologies. Right. Um, so we, we did. We, we said, let's let's start with an existing database. We started with Rethink. Um, more recently, we've also we support Mongo um, very natively now, MongoDB. Um, and build on top of that, and that led us to building Big Chain DB. But all the way along, actually, the goal was to have a scribe has always been, and the, the artists and the creators have always been our number one user, actually. And so we said, okay, as we're going to scale, what are all the pieces that we need? Um, and we realized that we needed not just scalable blockchain database software, uh, that is Big Chain DB, but also a public network for it. And so even when I talked last year, you know, it, it, it was forming, but we were actually, um, uh, having a lot of um, discussions and conferences and, and um, various cities all over the world with um, with folks on on what this might look like from a governance angle and so on. And um, that's what became IPDB, Interplanetary Database. Incidentally, there's a third piece too that I can talk about briefly at the end, and that's um, on the IP side of things. Um, one problem was scale, and that led us to Big Chain DB and IPDB, the software in the network. The other problem was flexibility of IP licensing. Um, we had developed this small overlay protocol on top of Bitcoin called the Spool Protocol, and um, it was fine for digital art, you know, claiming copyright, uh, uh, transferring single editions, you know, which is a bequeathing of certain rights. But um, artists kept coming to us and saying, hey, what about fractional ownership? Um, what about taking a still of a video? Um, how do you handle 3D? What about photography? And, um, in various ways, that led us to develop something called Koala IP, C-O-A-L-A IP. Um, and that was actually in sort of this uh, driven team too, not just us, but you know Juan Benet with IPFS, Simon with Ujo Consensus, um, Primavera with Koala, um, and Greg McMullen, who was my colleague in Big ChainDB and IPDB and others. So um, we developed this Koala IP and it actually reconciles with all the existing protocols too of um, DDX for music, plus for photography, et cetera. So really overall, we have these three um, building blocks, Big ChainDB the software, IPDB the public net, and, and Koala IP. And each has its own sort of governance, et cetera. Um, you know, Big Chain DB is a for-profit corporation. IPDB is actually a separate nonprofit that we spun out 
and it's controlled by the caretaker, so I can talk more about that. Um, and uh, and then Koala IP, which is still um, basically this sort of loosely formed group um, that came out of the Koala workshops run by Prim Primavera and Constance, uh, Primavera de Philippi, Constance Chua. So um, that's sort of what led to all of this. Um, and um, maybe I'll pause for a second and then I can dive into sort of what led to, you know, a bit more of the history of what's went on with BigTDB and IPDB since. So let's go right into to IPDB then. Uh, so IPDB is the public implementation of the big chain DB protocol. And I, I think this, I find this really interesting because until now, you know, we have, we have what, what real blockchain networks do we have out there? We've got Bitcoin, Ethereum, and okay, like whatever, how many altcoins there are. Uh, but you know, the real platforms, the, the, the major players, Bitcoin, Ethereum, they are public blockchains that were launched as public blockchains. Mm -hmm. And, and now Ethereum, you know, we're starting to see uh, sort of enterprise um, traction there, and you know, perhaps you know, some private enterprise Ethereum networks will start to emerge. Mm -hmm. uh, on on the other hand, you guys start out as this more or less uh, private blockchain type system. At least that's the way that I always saw Big Chain DB. Is Big Chain DB is a is, is a protocol that will be deployed by enterprise and you know as a as a private network. And now you're implementing a public yeah. Im implementation of that. As as far as I know, I mean, okay, so cosmic net the the Cosmos network will be somewhat similar, I guess. You know, from Tendermint to Cosmos. As far as I know, you guys are the first to do this. Yeah. Uh, what type of things are you are you learning from having you know deployed this network as or this having this technology first as a as a technology that was intended for private use, I guess, but now moving into having a public network. So it's actually, uh, quite honestly, customer number one has always been a scribe, which has always been about the public net. Um, so, uh, but we always saw that, um, you know, why not have it deployed? So there's really three types of possible deployments. There is the public deployment, where anyone can read, anyone can write from it, um, and that is IPDB. But others can, you know, have their own deployments that are fully public too. Then consortium deployments, where you might have, you know, 10 or 30 organizations running nodes together, and um, it might be, you know, automotive self-driving car consortium or something else. And then the third one is actually within enterprises, um, where you don't get as much benefits from decentralization, but you actually still have the Merkle egg and a bit of a degree of immutability, as well as the, the signed transactions, which are actually really, really good for data trails and provenance. So um, so all three are, are relevant use cases, and uh, and they have just, you know, different way, ways of being used, but there's really three deployments, right? Public, consortium, and within en enterprises. So, um, but also, by the way, you know, within enterprises, they can also use public nets. You know, we're seeing some of that where enterprises are using public Ethereum, right? And that's great. Um, so uh, the other thing to just sort of emphasize uh, how we designed from day one to be complementary to um, some of the other key systems out there, right? Um, we see that um, with compute infrastructure, you've got processing and you've got storage. And um, within processing, um, it actually breaks down to two things, business logic and high performance compute. So business logic processing, um, the decentralized version, is really where Ethereum plays really well, right? Um, and this is where Hyperledger and uh, other sort of smart contracts play in, right? And high performance compute, this is actually an emerging category where we have things like Truebit and Golem, iExec, et cetera, right? So those are overall, this is all within the realm of processing. Uh, we're also seeing people are actually running VMs um, on top of BigChainDB or um, you know, JavaScript in the browser that's just talking directly to um, BigTDB, et cetera. So this is the processing on the storage. You've got file systems, database, and actually what I see now is a store of value. So um, on the file system, this is things like IPFS, storage, et cetera. With the database, this is exactly BigTDB and it's public net IPDB. And then in the stores of value, this is the traditional ledgers, right? So Bitcoin, the ledger, um, Zcash, they're not trying to do much more than just store the, the value. And actually, most other blockchains have some sort of, you know, token storage too. So overall, you know, this is the stack that we see um, where you've got um, processing, including business logic and HPC. And then you've got storage, including file system, database, and store of value. And we've always seen ourselves as aiming to be the best in class blockchain database, decentralized database. And um, we've always been aiming for the public net as well as serving the enterprise. We kind of straddle those. Um, we've always sort of seen that, you know, enterprises, they have specific problems to solve. We understand the enterprise and it actually helps uh, our business model, right? Uh, we are um, selling, 
we have open source software, but we're like MongoDB, so they have an enterprise version, and we're moving towards that too, right? So um, it's a way, basically, um, so we can serve the enterprise via, you know, the sort of enterprise E-level software, but we can serve the, the startups who aren't willing or don't have the funds um, to build their own consortiums, et cetera. They can simply use IPDB. And overall, it's my dream, you know, five years, 15 years from now, where 99% of the applications are IPDB itself, right? And that will be fine because there's lots of other um, business-related uh, things that um, Big Chain DB, the company, can do too. And I think this is just healthier for the planet. So, you know, to be that best-in-class database software and then best-in-class public database network, that still plays well with everything else for to on transferring value, you know, connecting via Interledger, connecting via Cosmos, et cetera. So if, if I understood correctly, you, you just said that in a few years, you, you would hope to see 99% of the applications built on so this this stack uh, using I uh, the public uh, block, net. Yeah, using the public net okay so so you so in your view then the consortium network uh, uh, you know of, of uh, you know 10 or 15 companies within an industry collaborating on a, a on a on a single process or sort of regulated process that model you don't, you don't see a future for that model or uh, no I, I see a future as niche Actually, I see a future, but what's going to happen is that they're going to melt into the public net via Interledger and Cosmos, et cetera, right? And I think that's really, really healthy. So just like, you know, rewind um, 20, 30 years, and you would have all these different private nets, um, you know, via LAN or, or its precursors. And then um, they they started joining, you know, and TCP IP actually connected these things, right? And, um, you know, ARPANET, NSFNet, all these, like these really, really early networks got connected with TCP IP. And um, I see that IPDB will be a big public global database from day one, and it will sort of be like this backbone upon which other things can be linking. But it's not going to be the centerpiece, if you will. It just it will be another sort of node in the network, right? And some of these networks will be much more sort of smart contracty, like decentralized business logic processing, uh, and some of them will be much more databasey, like um, like Big Chain DB, IPDB, and that's okay, right? And just like right now, you know, you can have some software as a service that has a database like HTTP as the interface, but below it, you've got some um, database as a service. But other behind other HTTP interfaces, you might have payments like Stripe, right? So I see a similar thing emerging um, where these protocols uh, include value as well in a, in a blockchain sense, right? And tokens, et cetera. And, um, you know, all these components will play well together. So um, for the consortiums, like they'll still be there. It'll just be much more public. Um, and I think, you know, why would you bother setting up governance of a consortium if you can all just use the public net, right? And even companies themselves, you'll see now, like a lot of them actually internally, they don't even bother with uh, LAN protocol. They just follow the, the public HTTP protocol and connect directly to the internet, right? I see. Okay. I see where you're going. So talk, to, talk about IPDB then. This is, a, a, a again, comparing to Ethereum or Bitcoin, on on the validation side, it's a very different type of uh, uh, a validation scheme. So there are a, a, a predefined or sort of a limit number of validators. The validators are are chosen. So it, it's it's sort of this um, intersection between a consortium network and a public network, where the network is given or made available as, as a public good, but validated by a federated set of nodes. So talk about the governance model there and how that works and, and perhaps the foundation as well. My pleasure. There was a lot of thinking that went into this. So, um, so background wise, um, one of our key advisors uh, is David Holtzman. He's the fellow who rolled out uh, the public DNS in the late 90s. And he was maintaining it all throughout the 90s. Um, and then they 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 hashed ICANN and, and you know that governed the, the DNS for years and still does, um, for better or for worse, right? There was things that happened which are kind of sad with ICANN and you know David is actually pretty sad about that, right? And also the other people involved, you know Jim Rutt, Esther Dyson, Pinder Wong. Uh, if you talk to them and I have about this, they they have you know there was a lot of the great things that happened, but there's some very sad things that happened too. You know things like the fact that we have dot sucks as a domain name, like. And it's basically extortion. You know, Microsoft has to go and buy dot sucks from the TLD guys for dot sucks um, for 10 grand or whatever. So um, as well as things like dot bank. So overall, um, we, we, we had a series of questions and constraints that we wanted to solve for. Uh, um, and it came down to um, how do we make sure that we aren't captured by money um, and we aren't captured by a jurisdiction? such that the system can keep running over the next five years, 50 years, 500 years in a way where uh, 
it serves the decentralized internet. And so um, we, we said, given this, um, first of all, we have to say, okay, let's say we do have this federated type system where there's, um, you know, 20 nodes or 50 nodes or growing 300, right? Then with each of these, we want to make sure that the people running these nodes um, care about the future of the decentralized internet. And so that was a constraint. That is a constraint to be a caretaker. But then beyond that, um, the majority have to be nonprofits. And that is actually solves the question of the, the dollar capture, right? Because now instead of having um, dollars at stake, the way that, you know, typical proof of stake systems work, it's actually reputation at stake. So, you know, and these caretakers are like Internet Archive, Open Media Foundation, et cetera. If they start attacking the system, it kills the reputation that they've been building up over the decades sometimes, right? So um, it's sort of like, you know, a proof of stake system where you're, you're staking something, but you're actually staking your reputation. It's not an economic incentive, right? And then the second concern was jurisdictional capture. And an example of this is um, Bitcoin right now. You know, the vast majority of mining is in China. What if um, China closes off its um, its uh, internet from the rest of the world for a while, say a week, right? Then you'll actually have a partition of the Bitcoin network. You'll have mining going on outside of China and inside. And then let's say China opens it up again, then it all heals. And the Chinese um, side will be the longer chain. So all the transactions in the rest of the Bitcoin network that previous week would have gone away, right? And what this means is actually that we actually essentially have jurisdictional capture right now um, with Bitcoin um, within one country. And that's actually sad, right? Like, I'm a fan of Bitcoin. Bitcoin has inspired us all. And um, it's kind of too bad that right now um, we have, uh, you know, this, this capture within a jurisdiction. And there's other examples of jurisdiction we have to watch for. Like, for example, if we had the majority of caretakers in the USA, what if some of the less than inspired leadership decided to crack down on IP laws, um, even in a crazier way, right? Like sending letters to anyone that it might have possibly infringed ever, 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 right? And um, so you, you don't want to be dependent on one nation um, in terms of jurisdiction um, too badly. So we said uh, no given, our rule is no given a country can have more than 30% of the nodes, right? And, and we actually try to spread it as far as we can in terms of the new caretakers. So, you know, we now have caretakers in, you know, USA and Canada, um, in all over Europe, um, in Kenya, and that's expanding more, right? So, and when I say we, um, uh, actually, we, uh, we no longer have control of this. So um, how IP2B is set up, um, that the caretakers, they have two key roles. They are voting. Um, so they have the power to vote each other in and out. They have the power to vote and elect the board of directors. The board of directors then... Um, hires day-to-day -day management. So they actually control um, this nonprofit foundation. It's a German nonprofit. So they vote, but then they also run the nodes. So they actually have this sort of day-to-day -day activity themselves of running the nodes. So th those are the, the roles of the caretakers, which are the heart and soul of the system. And we have already handed over control to the caretakers. So um, they actually control the governance, which is actually really, really awesome, right? Big Chain DB doesn't. Uh, you know, we hashed it, but we don't control it. So, uh, and the majority are nonprofits. We have a few for-profit companies too, um, besides, uh, such as Big Chain DB, um, Protocol Labs, the IPDB guys. And at some point, Stratum will be too, I, I hope, as long as the caretakers are with them in, right? I really hope they do. So I, I can't control it, but uh, um, I can try to influence, I suppose. Um, anyway, so that's, that's the overall sort of process of this. Um, in terms of, um, you know, sort of the openness, the publicness, and so on, um, there's a, actually interesting, these things are much closer than you might expect, right? So if you think about like a proof of stake system like Casper, right? What Casper is, is you've got these different, um, at any given point in time, you have a set of identities that are allowed to validate, right? And they get um, voted on through a relatively uh, fancy um, crypto economic mechanism, right? And then they're, they're, they're posting bonds so that if they, um, if they act badly, then they lose that bond, right? Um, and there's other systems that are sort of proof of stake, like delegated proof of stake is actually quite similar. Um, so this is the Cosmos stuff and the BitShares, for example, where, for example, in BitShares, um, you have um, one token, one vote, and then you can vote on whoever you want, right? And in the end, though, you're electing 100 validators, right? So in this case, you're choosing the validators based on, uh, it's the richest, actually, you get to choose validators. To me, um, you know, it's kind of too bad that it's the richest that get to choose, but I guess that's a bit of a surrogate for identity, right? Um, with with um, Tendermint, uh, it's actually the richest automatically become the validators, right? Whoever has um, posted the most bond actually um, gets to become the validators, the top 100. Um, all of this actually I see is, a, is sort of a placeholder for good identity. Um, so, you know, with Bitcoin, and it's essentially one electron, one vote. Um, um, with these uh, proof of stake systems, it's sort of like um, one stake, one vote, if you will. But ident ideally, we would actually literally have one identity, one vote. So imagine if we had a really, really good identity system overall for the world. Um, 
that uh, we could know that every single human was their own identity signing in. And, um, you know, imagine there's a perfect system, then each person could um, be a validator. Now, that's really nice. But or, or if you want, you can go delegate a proof of stake style where um, one uh, each person can vote for um, whatever validator and then whichever 100 validators get chosen, get chosen. Right. And so um, because delegated proof of stake is sort of a way to convert something that's BFT or pseudo BFT into something that's much more of a public net. Right. So what, how IPDB is right now, it's sort of this, this federation, but it is um, and it has these identities, these sort of vetted identities uh, out there right now, 20, but um, it's going to go from 20 to 40 to 60, et cetera. And then at some point we will switch over to a, a system that is actually much more open where it's truly one human entity, one vote. So, for example, you don't have to have something perfect to start with. Maybe you just say, OK, if you have Estonian e-residency, you get to have a vote. Uh, or you're vetted by one of these 10 different agencies, you know, maybe KYC from Authentic, the company, or one of other 10 KYC providers, right? So this is a bit like the sort of um, CA system that we have for um, HTTPS. But that's actually not bad, right? It's, it's better than sort of one electron, one vote, where then you have, you know, massive amounts of, of value that way. And um, it will be emergent. Um, no one has a perfect solution yet. You can have multiple different types of markers. You can have the sort of, you know, government vetting. You can have biometric markers. You can have um, stuff that is stored in your brain's memory, like um, brain wallets, et cetera, and then combine all these, right? And there's a lot of research on this. This is, you know, um, uh, whole fields are dedicated to this identity authentication, et cetera. But I think the ideal is really one identity, one vote. And, and we're all trying to work towards that. And what I've come to realize, it's not that, you know, proof of stake is virtual mining. It's actually everything is about... Um, trying to get towards this ideal of one identity, one identity, one vote. So IPDB has its own own path. Um, you know, Ethereum has its path. Bitcoin has sort of a pseudo path depending on its governance, right? Um, so with IPDB, you know, it has very transparent governance. You know, everything is recorded, et cetera, et cetera. And they oversee the, the choices of the protocol. Um, and, and like I said, anyone can write to it. Anyone can read from it. The only difference, and any therefore anyone can be a client to it. The only difference is, to be one of the validating nodes right now, you have to actually be approved by one of the, you have to apply and then the caretakers vote you in, right? So um, it's democratic already. And as time goes on, um, it will be more broadly democratic. But okay. I, guarantee, I guarantee it won't be based on how much money you have. You'll never get to vote based on how much money you have. All right. Well, yeah, the, that, if, if, if you want a, a publicly open system, as you describe it, that is a public good, I mean, that, that that's a good that's a good starting point, you know, yeah. not not to have uh, interests of uh, those who have the resources uh, put forth before the, the interests of those who don't have the resources. So you, there are a lot of things that I'd like to come back to. Um, first, uh, coming back to the foundation, now you mentioned a few things that you learned from those who created the initial DNS and 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 then ICANN. One one of the things that was interesting that I find interesting about the IPDB Foundation and its governance model is these rules that you've put in place, right? Uh, no thirty, you can't have more than thirty percent of validators in a single country, or more than fifty percent of the validators have to be um, nonprofits. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Do you think that if measures such as these had been implemented as founding governance rules of organizations like ICANN, we would have a very different system today. How, how do you, how do you think we, you know, what would the internet look like today had those rules been implemented with ICANN? Yeah, um, you know, for all I complain about ICANN, I think actually, you know, it's, it is powering the internet, right? It's this database that's powering the internet in a very, very particular way. It has its flaws, but, you know, um, we have these, you know, these, the main TLDs that everyone uses like .com are, you know, have been around a long time. Um, so these things would have helped a bit. Um, would the internet look dramatically different? Probably not, because actually all in all, DNS is not that bad, you know, unless you act like ask some like deep crypto hacker, it's all in all not too bad. I mean, we had a conversation with the guys from uh, the Ethereum naming system recently. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I find, and we discussed this, and one of the things that I find particularly Unfortunate about DNS is uh, the, the 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 system by which new top level domain names can be registered. Agreed. Not to have a whole debate about that, but what what are the things in what are the things in 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 ICANN that you think you really think should be avoided in I, in IPDB? And what can we learn from the experience? You know, 20, 30 years of ICANN, however long it's been, 
that we wouldn't want to have in IPDB? Yeah, there's a few lessons. So one of them actually was, um, the, in terms of dollar capture, what happened is that the registrars captured ICANN, right? And what this means is um, uh, the registrars, you know, if they could actually start registering a whole bunch more TLDs, then they make much more money, right? So they made a, actually a very low barrier to entry for people to have, create a lot more TLDs. And now we've had this TLD explosion. Um, and so companies like the big enterprises that want to protect their brand, corporate brands, et cetera, have to buy up all these other, other TLDs. And then also there's a sort of mad rush among everyone else too. Um, would have there been a better way? Almost certainly, right? Um, and so I think that's the challenge. You know, basically, I, ideally, you don't have money interests making decisions that are for governance of sort of fundamental human infrastructure like like the internet or the DNS, right? Um, and so, you know, ENS is exciting, um, but I think actually... Um, I, I don't know how much they've talked to the DNS guys from what I gather, not very much because there's a, there's a lot of other learnings too. One one was um, David Holtzman. He's sort of an unsung hero of the internet for doing this, but he went and actually re- kept all the domain names of uh, anything related to hate speech and hate words and, you know, um, uh, racial slurs, that sort of thing. He actually kept them all to himself. And then as the internet was taking off, he, he actually gave it to um, advocacy groups such as like blacks rights groups and so on. And I think this was really wonderful. He just didn't tell anyone about it. But, you know, maybe I'll say right now, like, full shout out to you, David, for doing that. Like, good job, man. So this is why, um, you know, this is and there's a lot of sort of decisions that he made that were he was just trying to be thoughtful. Right. Um, And, you know, maybe there's better ways to do it. I think uh, the fact he was making those decisions while he was still CTO at Network Solutions, which is a public sorry, a publicly traded company. It was a for profit, though. And um Ideally, these can be made much more in the open with um, a much more, you know, broad vetting process to try to include all the learnings from the past, right? And this is actually what we are trying to do with IPDB. And to give you a feel, right, with IPDB, we've got these 20 caretakers, but then the board of directors, actually, it does include David, right? And it includes um, uh, Greg McMullen, uh, you know, that's the fellow who's running IPDB, the main guy. Um, and he actually, before doing Big Team DB and IPDB, he was actually uh, doing stuff uh, helping uh, with privacy. You know, he actually did a class action lawsuit against Facebook on behalf of Canadians for screwing with Canadians' privacy, right? We also have uh, Constance Chua, who uh, runs uh, Koala, which is, you know, a blockchain legal initiative, but she's ex-EFF, right? So all about, you know, um, privacy as well. And then uh, Nina Louis Sadler, who is um, a German uh, lawyer and blockchain expert. So um, so these people together, they're actually thinking about a lot about these issues, engaging with the government, basically really trying to build bridges to the law and what's going on rather than trying to run away and say, you know, this stuff is, is different than the law than the law. So we're actually really, um, the IPDB folks are really trying to work with the EU and the German governments, et cetera, to try to actually set up the laws in a way that works. And I think, you know, that's really nice learnings. Um, going back, you know, like the the, the, the learnings that David had, um, he, he he instills these every day in us and he asks questions uh, as, we're, as we're rolling this out. And not just David, right? Um, Jim Rutt, who had been CEO of Network Solutions Inc. through the 90s. I've known Jim for almost 20 years, and we, we iterate a lot as well about this, right? So uh, we're really fortunate to have, you know, people who were rolling out these initial internet infrastructure blocks um, coming in and working with us. And it's not just those guys, right? Like things like, you know, last year there was the Decentralized Web Summit at Internet Archive, and you had Tim Berners-Lee there and Vince Cerf, and, and these guys continue to be involved, and I think that's wonderful, right? Um, you know, they care about the, the future of the internet, too. And, you know, for the first time in probably more than 10 years, like major things are happening, right? Like all of this blockchain movement, it's not about blockchains. It's actually about next level infrastructure for humanity. It's the layers above TCP IP and next to it and above HTTP and next to it. And um, and it's cool because we now have a business model for it too, right? In tokens, right? Rather than advertising, that is so healthy on its own. So I'll stop there. But overall, like we, we have to look keep looking to history and reading about it and talking to people and learning as much as we can and trying to avoid repeating those mistakes. No, definitely. I agree that having people like David Holtzman part of this new new era of decentralized infrastructure is great because we, we can pull from, from the lessons that they've learned and the things that they've done to try to avoid the same problems that we've uh, yeah. you know, perhaps seen in, 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 uh, in, in other uh, endeavors. Um, coming back to the foundation, one of the things that strikes me is Kind of unusual, I guess, uh, given the type of organization or the type of technology that we're, your IPDB is, is built on, is the fact that this is you know, sort of looks like a you know, typical foundation with uh, you know yeah. a, a, a governance rules and uh, and a board. And I'm curious, why didn't you th- or you know, why didn't you think that it would be a good idea to 
run the governance you know, using a smart contract, for instance? Just because a piece of technology is there, a shiny new piece of technology, doesn't mean it's the best technology, right? You know, um, if, a, if there's a piece of statistics from a paper from 1925 or earlier, like by Fisher or Gauss or something, and it works better than a fancy new paper from last year out of Stanford or something, then I'll use the 1925 paper, right? So same thing here. So there is governance technology that has been developed over hundreds of years. You know what they're called? Corporations, nonprofits, et cetera. And they actually, they have evolved to solve a whole bunch of issues around governance, right? Over hundreds and hundreds of years. And so what we're doing is we're actually leveraging governance technologies that have actually been adapted and used and applied over generations and generations. So um, to me, it's, it's kind of a no brainer. Like would I use some governance technology that can only cover 10% of all possible cases and ignores the rest just because it's living in a blockchain versus um, some tried and tested technology that actually covers all the bases, all the messy human stuff, right? Um, and, and actually has, has ways to address that. So to me, it's a no brainer. Now that's not to say um, that we, we don't want to use um, uh, some of the you know, smart contracty stuff over time, right? But it's a walk before you run thing, right? Um, this stuff has to mature first. So we saw that why take the risk in governance um, on this, you know, whole new um, set of technologies yet when it's not there yet. And lots of, you know, wonderfully smart people are working on this bit by bit by bit. And uh, that's great because we'll leverage it as it comes along. But w there's no need to add extra risk to this project, this, you know, new fundamental internet infrastructure, this database for the planet by introducing risky technology at this point. So we're, we're picking and choosing our battles. And to give you an illustration, um, you know, when I first announced IPDB, um, it was at the um, Blue Yard Summit uh, last June, Decentralized and Encrypted. Right after me, um, so this was actually early June. This was actually the height of the DAO. The DAO had surpassed, I think, 150 million in funding, but none of the hacks had happened yet. I think Vlad was just starting to write about his worries and some others, right? And so right after me, uh, Christoph Jens was um, uh, speaking. And uh, so... Uh, when I spoke, people people had been asking me, why aren't you going? You know, are you guys going to make a DAO of this and all that? And I said, you know, I, I said directly, you know, we love the idea of of doing a DAO, but not yet in time, right? And IPDB itself as an organization is designed to melt away ten years, twenty years from now, whatever it takes, once everything gets automated enough. Because you know, we don't think like we think that over time things can get automated enough, but we have to actually you know walk before we run. And so after my talk, you know, Christoph came up and he talked to actually all about the DAO and it was a, an interesting contrast, right? And um, what's really, really cool, um, you know, that obviously the DAO imploded in all this and, you know, the Ethereum community and the broader blockchain community asked, asked a lot of great questions and has continued to learn from that experience since, right? Um, you know, we haven't uh, gone, you know, live running $150 million yet on, on with IPDB, but it will come too and this technology will get tested. Um, but I think it's really cool that the conversation flows. Um, you know, we we have a meetup actually with Big Chindi B and IPDB. It's every month, and uh, a couple of months ago we actually had Greg come on to talk about IPDB governance, and Christoph talking about the learnings from the DAO. And then there was a, a panel afterwards with those two and Sherman Bushmaker, who is also a lawyer and she was one of the curators of the DAO, etc. And it was actually remarkable how similar the thinking was. Um, these worlds are not so different as you think. Everyone is trying to solve the same problems. You know, how do you govern the protocol? What do you do when um, things go wrong, et cetera? And uh, we have various technologies to deploy, not just the smart contracts technologies of the last several years, but also these um, old school governance technologies that go back decades. Let's use them. Uh, interesting. Okay. So uh, now I'd like to talk about the, the, the network itself. And so at this time, so the network is sort of running as a, as a test net, I believe. Um, yeah. Is, yeah. So the overall plan. Yeah. Okay. So the overall plan is uh, there's a test net and a production net will come. And with okay. the test net, um, yeah, we've actually had the test net running uh, quietly with some lead users since last October, but very, very quietly just to sort of vet it out. And um, more recently, we've we've been developing actually a developer portal for it, um, such that um, it's really easy to basically sign up and start using it and talking to it via an HTTP API. And it has a whole bunch of things like DDoS protection and all this. You know, it's running in GenX, Kubernetes, Docker, all this sort of thing. So that it, it feels like a full-on um, software as a service that's fully professional that you might expect. It's So we take a lot more cues from sort of the mainstream software world than from the blockchain world and how we do things, right? Like, you know, the sort of shift to containers in the last two years is, is phenomenally useful. And we are embracing it wholeheartedly, right? Um, as well as, you know, other technologies. So... 
under the hood, basically, uh, yeah, we've got these pieces in terms of it getting rolled out. Um, so we've got this developer portal that um, now we're, 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 we've been opening up to more and more folks. We've actually had a wait list of um, 250 plus organizations. And these have been tremendously patient folks. So those of you on the wait list, thank you for your patience. We're starting to now um, open it up to everyone out there. So my hope is within the next month, all of those folks and beyond will be using the test net. Um, and uh, and easily, you know, we really held back. We couldn't scale before because we really needed we really needed the developer portal to be there to be easy to use. So right now it's a test net. The the caretakers are are running the network uh, altruistically, I guess, and also to sort of test it out and make sure that this was something that can move into production. When the system goes to production, when it goes live, and when all those organizations start using it as a production system to build their decentralized consortium blockchain applications, you know, that's fancy stuff. Um, what, how much does it cost to use the network? Does it cost anything? What, what's the economic model there? Um, should there? Will there be a token? Or are you guys going to do a crowd sale? Or? Yeah, so overall, I'll talk about the, the now for starters. So um, uh, we actually, once again, you know, there are no native tokens inside IPDB. We actually um, went the traditional web services way, which was asking ourselves, how much will it cost to store data for forever? And of course, forever um, is infinity, and then the price is potentially infinity. So then we said, okay, well, what about 50 years? Okay. So we said, okay, um, how much would it cost to store data for 50 years? And there's baselines, right? So if you put um, a gigabyte of data into uh, AWS Azure, it's $3 per gigabyte per month. Okay. And um, so with that as a baseline, then we said, okay, well, what about Moore's Law? You know, storage is getting cheaper by cheaper, cheaper every year. Uh, we, we found some very conservative numbers where it's getting 17% cheaper per year and then extrapolated this and we assume that it plateaus in 10 years. So um, basically it's getting a bit cheaper every year, plateaus in 10 years. But also um, we said, okay, if we're going to store this thing for 50 years, uh, knowing that it's getting cheaper though, then um, how much is it going to cost um, overall? How much does someone have to pay up front? And as we ran the numbers um, with various models and so on, we also took into account inflation. Of, and the fact that you can invest the money. So they put X dollars in that gets invested with a, so we assumed actually 4% rate of return. And that's actually typical value for a government bond. It hasn't, much changed, hasn't changed much over the decades. 3% inflation, which means overall 1% rate of return. What this came down to for a number actually is the very aggressive estimates are about 25 euros um, for storing for forever. Um, more conservative was about 75. So we said, we're just going to start off with 100. So basically, when people are using the production net, it's $100 per gigabyte forever. And when we say forever, um, we define it as 50 years, but it's interesting. Once you put that money in, it gets invested, and it hits an escape velocity about 20, 25 years in, such that it actually does pay for things forever, which is really cool. And it's very different, right? Because if you put something into, say, like Bitcoin or Ethereum, um, you're kind of hoping that the network is going to stick around, right? It's different here. It's actually a contract that you're... Um, making where you're paying money up front, but it's actually getting stored by this contract um, uh, for forever. You're not just hoping that someone will keep maintaining the nodes. And that's really, really cool. And there's other like long-term contracts out there. We looked around, right? There's things like this in um, in trust funds, like the Rockefeller Trust Fund, et cetera. Graveyards, you know, actually I can buy a plot for myself when I die, you know, 50 or 100 years from now, whatever. And that's actually uh, kind of interesting too. And then I can actually buy plots for my family for the next 500 years. So you can actually have these long-term contracts that exist. And we've done that essentially here. So overall, uh, we've ran the numbers. Uh, like I said, it's $100 per gigabyte uh, for forever. That's very conservative. We actually hope that um, within a year or two of running this for the production net, that we can pull that down by, by 10x or more. To whom do you pay this money? How do you pay the money? Is it Do you, do you pay the foundation? or? Uh, yeah, so right now... Um, to start with, it's actually going to go through the foundation and the foundation reimburses the nodes. But very, very quickly, um, this is going to get basically um, more decentralized in the sense of they can pay one of um, uh, many, they can pay one of the caretakers directly, get tokens for usage. And then it, tokens, it's just like an AWS token. It's not a fungible token that you can have on exchange, et cetera. And then by that, um, it doesn't have to flow through the foundation at all, right? And that's just healthier. So um, overall, uh, that's kind of where we're headed. Um, interestingly, it's super efficient. Um, if you think about how much it costs to store um, data on Bitcoin, right? So one transaction, four years ago when we were working on Ascribe, three and a half, it was 10 cents per transaction. Um, a year ago, it was $1 per transaction on Bitcoin because of the mining fees, right? Like the miners automatically set the fees. Actually, the Bitcoin network has been kind of going crazy this past week. So now it's it's been jumping up to like $3 and $9. It's kind of crazy, but 
I assume that will go down, but overall, even if you say it's $1 per transaction, then uh, we run the numbers. And for us, it is, um, if one of our transactions is one kilobyte, kilobyte, which is actually conservative, then you means you can have 1 million transactions for that $100, right? So that means we're um, many, many, many orders of magnitude cheaper than Bitcoin, right? Is it 10,000? Something like that, right? So um, uh, that's, that's quite exciting. So anyone who actually wants to store sort of data or, or even issue assets and tokens, here you have the system that's just using just straight up simple engineering, like, you know, how would an engineer um, go about this? Um, this is the numbers we came up with, right? It's, it's, it sounds kind of insane that you can be like, you know, so much cheaper, but not really if you kind of just go through the logic, this thought process that I just described, right? And um, with Ethereum, you know, it's a little bit cheaper than Bitcoin, but we're still orders of magnitude different. But this is actually why um, IPDB is designed as it is. It's actually a database that's meant to store data, you know, not the hashes, the data itself. That's what a database does. And it's meant to be complementary to Ethereum and Bitcoin, right? And there are people building systems that have um, Ethereum and IPDB and actually IPFS too, right? All three for the files, for the, for the structured data and for the business logic, right? Okay, so we're we're really running long on this episode, I recognize, but I, there, I do want to talk about one last thing, and that is use cases for IPDB. Um, I, I I have some use cases in mind. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, talk to a lot of organizations and a lot of enterprise about how blockchain can be used uh, to facilitate data transfer. Basically, I mean, I, I start I'm starting to see blockchains really as a messaging system between in, in the enterprise context. Uh, as a, gov uh, a governed messaging system between enterprise. Uh, and the, the potential for that is massive. So tell us some of the things that um, people are building on, IT on IPDB uh, today or things that perhaps you see as use cases in the future. Sure. So I'll, I'll push this from two angles, one from sort of verticals and one from um, sort of general purpose technologies. So verticals, um, maybe even I talked this in the last episode, I've seen sort of six major verticals that BigGDB itself is really most useful for, right? Um, identity, which includes authentication as well as uh, storing personal data towards the vision of sovereign personal data. Financial, intellectual property, energy, supply chain, and government. So of those, uh, financial mostly, you know, there's a desire for banks to be uh, private. And government, you know, it's sort of a bit private, a bit public, it's a bit strange. But the other ones are actually really great fits for, for public um, for, for their own various reasons. So um, for identity, you know, anything related to personal data, you don't want that to be held by some sort of consortium. You actually prefer that it's really much more public, right? And this is like, you know, towards the vision of sovereign personal data, all of this, it fits really well. So, um, you know, there's companies like Authentic that are building on top of us that are right now starting off with sort of KYC-ish stuff, but are moving towards sovereign personal data. Other people doing consent-based stuff, like consent uh, tokens uh, to solve GDPR, et cetera. So that's, that's a really big use case, all the sort of stuff in um, personal data. And we are engaged very deeply in that community around identity too. Um, and uh, I believe there's announcements coming in this too in the next few days at Consensus. So uh, the second one that is a really big use case is intellectual property, right? And so this is where we started once again with a scribe. Uh, and uh, so if you think about when I create a piece of digital art, my claim to that piece of digital art should really be see, visible for the, the whole world, the public, right? And it's not just digital art, it's all the music, right? Um, who composed the pieces, who performed the pieces. Right now, this is actually all locked up by the big labels and otherwise. And it's actually really sad. So the music mu music ecosystem is actually part, like largely broken in many really sad ways. And what it means is that um, musicians, uh, it might be three years before they're paid now because there's just so much data out there and the collecting societies um, where it's their mandate to actually figure out who played what when, um, it takes them three years to actually pay the artists. So, um, and I can keep going, right? All, all the other just sort of subfields of, of IP, everything from software licensing uh, to, to uh, um, novels. So, and we have people doing lots of this stuff on us. Going to the next field, um, supply chain is a big one. And you might think this is very enterprisey, but the challenge is actually how do you, the supply chains are massive, right? But they span the globe and there's many, many subnets within. So it's actually really hard to um, set up a supply chain consortium that actually really covers all the bases. So. Um, it's very straightforward, actually, than simply just to use uh, IPDB, right? Because then you're just putting the data on there, it's fine. Or maybe uh, you start with IPDB, and if you realize you really want to actually have your own thing, you can do it afterwards. But it bypasses having to do governance, where you're actually figuring out how to govern who's running the service, right? So um, I think that's a big one. Um, and then kind of overall, too, um, with government, there's sort of stuff that helps governments. 
And then there's stuff that does government-like um, actions. So stuff that helps governments is things like more transparency, et cetera, right? So um, it's really ideal if that stuff is put onto a public net. Um, and we, I think that we will see things like this happening over time. My favorite example here is actually Estonia. It's not running on a transparent blockchain per se right now, but it's been electronic since the wall fell in the early 90s. And um, these days, um, it would be natural if a government wanted to be more transparent to just sort of make that leap directly to a uh, blockchain to something like IPDB. Um, it's just much more straightforward. But then government-like registries are actually really powerful. And my favorite example here is Benben. Uh, they are a land registry in Ghana. Uh, basically, that means if, if I'm someone in Ghana who doesn't have money, maybe I've been living in the same house for you know, my generation, my, my family for two gener 50 generations or five generations, we never had title to it before, even though, and that's simply because the governments have gone through too much instability, right? So no one really trusts the government to maintain the land registry. But if you actually have this land registry that is um, independent of the government, that, you know, no one can kind of pull down, then you can start to take mortgages on this. Then you can start, you know, use these mortgages as loans to get education, to start companies, etc. So I'm very, very excited about Ben Ben um, because... Uh, they're doing exactly this, and they're doing it for Ghana and elsewhere. They're engaged with the UN and others to really, you know, bring these sorts of services to, to help the poor. So overall, identity, intellectual property, supply chain, and government-like things. Energy, it's, it's kind of to be determined. Um, you know, there's been a lot of experiments in energy. Um, there's some cool things, like we're working with um, Energy, you know, Germany's largest energy provider on several blockchain projects. But many of them are actually sort of more supply chain related and so on. So... Um, so for energy itself, uh, I, I think we'll see, but I think it, it makes sense that it's public too. Uh, overall, to give you some numbers, I'll just, um, I mentioned, yeah, like a waiting list of hundreds uh, on IPDB. With Big Chain DB itself, there's about 30 organizations that we know of building on us. About half or two thirds are startups. The other uh, third is, you know, large enterprises, consortiums, et cetera. And for everyone that we know of, you know, there tends to be another, you know, five or 10, as far as we can tell, that aren't. And we hear about another new one every day or two these days. It, it's pretty exciting. Uh, you know, heard about a couple more today because it's consensus, right? So um, people are starting to realize that, um, you know, BigChainDB and IPDB are a complementary piece of the stack, right? It's not just, you know, blockchain is a noun. It's actually you've got, you know, decentralized processing, decentralized file system, decentralized database, right? And then with this, um, you know, plug in the pieces, right? And um, they discover that BigTDB is really easy to use. Uh, you've got this. Now we have this public net. Um, people can get going, running against it in 20 minutes, right? Um, you know, all you have to do is just start making HTTP requests, right? And and then you're good to go. So I'm, I'm interested in a lot of these enterprise use cases. Uh, for obviously, at Stratum, we're confronted with a lot of these same use cases. And in fact, you know, we a lot of the, the the industries that you mentioned are the, specifically the industries the industries we, we target. And uh, one of the things that I think is is really important, and that sort of consortium closed networks provide is the well, a couple of things. So one is the ability to have uh, sort of privacy built in. This idea that only the consortium has access to the data, and you can have very malleable permission rules where I send data to one other participant in the system. That you know. I, I encrypt the data so that they can read it, or perhaps you know two or three participants, and that eliminates the possibility for sort of business intelligence to be done on the network. And then you can revoke access to the data, this sort of thing. Uh, and then you can layer things on top of that, like you can do then you can do sort of zero knowledge proofs, right, built on a blockchain network where only two participants are seeing the data, but the others can still validate the data to be part of some uh, validation rules. I think that these are really, really core to any blockchain implementation at a large scale for for enterprise, um, especially in sort of regulated processes. So like for instance, in insurance, we have regulated processes uh, where you're going to need these kind of features. And you need the regulator to be involved even in, in setting up the system and the governance and everything. How do you think that, do you think that given these constraints and that are oftentimes regulatory at the high level, do you think that public networks can really compete with consortium networks, given those constraints and how, how tightly they're set by the regulator? Yes, and here's why. Um, the technology um, of today is radically different um, in capabilities than it was three or four years ago. So, you know, we're, we're, we all kind of are calibrated by Bitcoin, where everything's sort of out there in public and so on, right? But just because a network is public doesn't mean that you can have shades of privacy inside, right? So Zcash, for example, right? You've got um, privacy in terms of the value that's sent, right? 
but you don't have to just have that. I, I view privacy, you have privacy at three levels. You have privacy of identity, uh, i.e. anonymity or pseudonymity. You have privacy of the value transferred, um, like Zcash is doing with zero knowledge proofs. And you actually have privacy in the payload itself, right? And, you know, the payload itself, this is something very specific to BigChainDB. It's a database, right? So, you know, it, acting as a database, it's about the payload. Of course, it supports tokens, et cetera, too. But on the payload side, this is really our sweet spot, right? So um, right now, you know, if you're using IPDB and I want to give data to you, if I wanted, um, I could say, hey, Sebastian, what's your public key? And then I would just encrypt it with your public key. I put that on the network and then you could decrypt it with your pri private key, right? So that would work. Of course, if I'm just sending to you, then there's a better way to send data than um, via a blockchain where, where all of that encrypted stuff is written there forever. We should use some sort of more lightweight messaging system, right? But um, that's possible. But another um, more relevant example is, say, I have personal data that I want to share, maybe some medical records that I want to share with, um, you know, a thousand different scientific teams around the world to do to include in their scientific research, right? The breakthrough here is that we can actually now have read permissions as assets. Think of it like token re tokenized read permissions. And this is something we've been working on actually with some lead clients over the last few months. And it, uh, we will be releasing it actually with our next release. It's 1.0. It's in mid-June. And we view it as sort of this beautiful marriage between the ideas of blockchain and the, the ideas of, da of database read permissions. So read permissions as assets. Um, I'll give you a feel. So imagine, um, now I, I gave this example before where I um, had encrypted your data um, with, uh, or encrypted my data with your public key. But instead of that, what if I encrypt um, my data, um, a symmetric key, and then you want to read my data, um, maybe because you're a medical researcher, or maybe it's something related to metadata of music or something, right? Where there's going to be lots of thousands of shares. Um, so then basically, I simply, uh, I've got this this data that's sitting out there. It's it's encrypted with a symmetric key. And then if, if you want it, I just simply encrypt the symmetric key with your public key. So I'm basically giving you, um, uh, securely giving you the symmetric key to this, right? And I'm doing it in a way where that can even be revo revoked in, in five minutes, right? Because you can actually have arbitrary crypto conditions around this. Uh, we're using the Interledger crypto conditions protocol around this. So you can sort of have arbitrary com um, combination logic um, that has, you know, multi-sig, like one of two, which is like an or, or two of two, which is like an and. You can have inverters on the data, you know, signatures. You know, the inputs are signatures or facts or time, right? And, and so you sort of arbitrarily compose with these multi-sig um, and OR gates, et cetera, and inverters. And, and then in the end, you can do whatever you want with this data. And it can be things like, okay, I'm giving you permission, but you don't have permission to pass it on to anyone else, right? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So overall, this, this concept is wildly powerful. And it actually um, resolves a bunch of the questions. I think consortiums are asking for privacy simply because um, there hasn't been an awareness that this technology is even possible. Now that it is, um, it just makes more sense because then you don't actually have to deal with the politics about who runs what nodes, et cetera. You can just use the public net, right? And um, it's just so much simpler. Now, there's still going to be cases where, you know, people will want to have, you know, data in jurisdictions. You know, the laws are still a bit fuzzy there, et cetera. So you're going to need that, right? But um, if... If, if you if that once that gets resolved, the thing that makes sense overall is actually all of the stuff is you know encrypted um, on a public net. Um, and by the way, too, you might ask, uh, we asked, what about quantum, right? And here's the cool thing: because IPDB is well governed, then we can literally migrate the data from the existing um, algorithms to a more quantum resistant algorithm in the future when that stuff starts to get more real. So that is even not a concern because because IPDB has good governance. Fascinating stuff. Uh, I wish we could go on, but we're nearing, I think, probably the longest show we've ever done. Uh, <laughs> we're pushing on uh, on a, you know over 90 minutes here, so we're, we're going to have to wrap it up. I mean, there's so many other things that I would have loved to cover. It will, we'll have to have you back on at some point, perhaps even uh, with some of the board members from... Uh, uh, from IPDB or custodians, uh, you know, we could definitely do that again. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for coming on Trent, uh, as, as a, a repeat guest. Uh, yeah. And you, by the way, you're, you're, you're getting up there in the, in the guests that have been on the show most often. I think you're at there, your fourth, probably your fourth time now. So. One thing you mentioned board members and I, I actually, I, I hate to miss people out. And I, I think I forgot to mention Casper Corgis. Uh, Casper runs Estonia e-residency and he's a board member as well. We're really honored to have him. So um, I just wanted to mention because I always like to give attribution when it, when it's deserved and due. So, um, but thank you for having me. I, I always uh, enjoy being on here. And once again, thanks for 
being flexible with with me and Fred having our crazy idea to, to do this together. So <laughs> no, it, it, it turned out uh, turned out reasonably well. I hope everything got. I hope all the recordings are fine and there's no screw ups on the technical side, but it should be fine. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So thanks again and enjoy your the rest of your week uh, in New York at Consensus and. Uh, We'll be looking forward to speaking soon. Thank you. And to our listeners, uh, thanks again for tuning in. We are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. You can find this show and lots of other great shows at letstalkbitcoin.com. Of course, if you like the show, there's lots of ways you can support us. One of those ways is by uh, leaving us an iTunes review, and you can also send us a tip. The tipping address will be in the show description. And of course, subscribe through uh, iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, you know, wherever you get your podcasts, and tell your friends to subscribe too. I mean, if you like the show, let your friends know. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being that back next week.